Okay, so I'm going to be starting off this series talking about um, data capture, and I'm going to be doing a quick little comparison of technology versus manpower. That's the title of um, the presentation. Um, and I'm also going to be touching on another thing that came up briefly yesterday at some point, which is called crowdsourcing. That's really um, sort of the general outline. So very simple, again, I'm talking about um, the entomological perspective on things and keep in mind entomological collections, there's lots of specimens in them typically, specimens are small, and the other thing you want to keep in mind is specimens are fragile. So we really want to think of you know, how you can capture data in the best possible way given these you know, problems and constraints. And then also keep in mind the things I'm talking about, you know, and I'm, for today, I'm pretty much just thinking dried, pinned, this would be an insect pin, pinned insect specimens. We're going to be talking about other types of invertebrate collections, like slight mounted specimens, for example, or things that swim around in ethanol, for example, tomorrow. But for today, I'm really thinking pinned insect specimens that sit in unit trays in big insect drawers, essentially. So this is what it typically looks like. You have a specimen of, you know, in this case, it's a pretty big specimen. And then you have typically not only one label sitting underneath that specimen, but very frequently you have multiple labels underneath it. So typically, and this is a good thing, on the top label you would have the locality, the date, and the collector. So some of the most crucial pieces of information we're really interested in when we think about data capture of insect specimen collections. But then, for some of us, and um, I want to bring up that ADBC digitization project where Melissa, Kim, and I are collaborating on, we're interested in the associations between insects and host plants. So for our particular project, these host labels that typically sit underneath the locality label are very, very important and very crucial. And that really determined the way we were going to be capturing the data as we were capturing. Then underneath that, you typically can have all sorts of identification labels. In this case, it says there's a family label, but it could also be you know, someone identified a specimen as belonging to a certain genus or a certain species. And then someone else came along and said, well, this is all wrong, but this person wouldn't have removed the label because there's just rule for us, entomologists at least, you never, and actually true for other disciplines as well, obviously, you never remove any label. So if there's a new identification, you don't pull out one of the labels from the pen and throw it out. You just stick another label underneath it. That really results that in many collections, especially big old historical collections, let's say, you know, London, for example, where a lot of people come through, look at specimens, do identifications, change their minds on identifications. You can you know, find stacks of five, six, seven, eight labels on any given insect pin. And keep that in mind because this is a problem for certain things I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so generally the idea is you can have manual data entry and I'm showing one of our former undergrad students here sitting in front of a computer. She has a stack of um, insert drawers next to her. This is the one she's working on. And she would you know, manually pull out every specimen, um, look at that, um, look at the data, and enter the data into the database. And I'm here showing a few of the other undergrad students um, who've been working on various projects, databasing projects in the lab over time, because really what, is, you know, what determines this manual data entry is how many bodies you can actually get to help you with the data entry. Okay, then um, a much newer approach is, I want to call it a semi-automated digitization because at this point in time there's nothing out there that would be actually an automated digitization. You still have some parts of the workflow where people obviously have to be involved in doing things. And then um, there's a few projects that do something that I would call in between. So there are some manual aspects and then some more semi-automated um, um, aspects in there as well. Okay, a manual data entry. The basics is you have a data baser. This is what we call the, the person. In our case, it's undergrad students. Typically, they can only work about 10 hours a week during the quarter, which is you know, a bad thing during the summer when they're in 
on break they can work for up to 40 hours which is a lot better obviously because you can actually get some extra work done and they enter the specimen data directly from the insect label into the computer there could be an excel spreadsheet or it could be the database itself and this is again the core information you've been seeing that with other databases as well i'm going to be showing you a screenshot of the database we're using in a second so it's really the taxonomic information has to be entered, locality information, the collection event, and the specimen information. So we're having ways of streamlining that in that we have a lot of drop-down menus, for example, in the database, uh, which make sure that things go faster, but also you try to reduce the errors that people can make by giving them options rather than having them type in certain things. And then um, other things are really, you want to essentially pre-curate your collection such that the whole process becomes fairly streamlined. So you go through the collection, make sure that everything is identified essentially by species, and then within a species for which you have, let's say, five, six, seven hundred specimens, you want to organize them such that the data entry becomes intuitive and very streamlined. We talk more about that tomorrow as well. Um, then one important thing, and it ties in with the lecture John was reluctantly just giving, um, we're attaching unique specimen identifiers to each of the labels. Again, that goes in hand with, a, um, we call that staging, the, the curation part before we actually start data entry. So we go through the specimens, we double check if they're, you know, we, we sex them as we call, we separate males from females because we want to capture that information as well. And then after we did that, we just go through and attach one little matrix code label to each of the specimens. It takes a bit of time, but really overall, in the overall process, I think it's, well, obviously it's worth the effort, and it's not the most time costly thing in the entire enterprise, I would argue. And overall, things like that, workflows like that, has really been the standard approach during the past 10 or 15 years or so. And this is just, again, to show you a potential data entry, um, data entry portal in which you would go through the different fields while looking at a specimen and then transcribing the inter information into all these fields. Okay, the challenges. Um, and the challenges are pretty obvious. One challenge is the speed with which you capture data. And it can be expressed in either cost um, or just the time it takes to handle one specimen. So obviously, because we're all concerned about how much money things cost, we usually express um, the data, uh, or the, we express um, the speed and cost, essentially. We say it takes about this and that much money to enter or capture one specimen, really. Okay, so you also realize that for big museums, let's say the Natural History Museum in London, they have 30 million specimens, and Blagodorov and colleagues in this, you're gonna be seeing a lot of names at all 2012. So those are all the Zuki's volume publications that we kept mentioning over the last two days. So if you're interested, it's free, it's online. It's a really good resource to look through some of these publications. So that citation comes out of this. So there are 30 million insect specimens housed at the Natural History Museum, and they calculated that it would require 23 years of continuous work, that means 40 hours a week, from the entire departmental staff to complete, and this is 65 people. So this is just, you know, it's not realistic, obviously, because no one would have the resources and could spend that much money and time and doing something like what we're doing in our project. So people really have to think about better and faster and new ways of capturing data. Okay, the speed is the first thing and in many ways the most graphic. Um, there's also a few other challenges or concerns. Um, obviously you have to train and manage your data entry personnel. And if you're at a museum, for example, and you have access to people who can work 40 hours a week and can stay in place for multiple years, it's not a big deal. I'm working at a university and I deal with undergrad students mostly for these data entry um, positions. And they don't last very long, to put it that way, just because they're, we get to know them when they're in their third year 
and then typically they graduate at the end of their fourth year. So we have, you know, we're lucky if we keep people for more than two years, which means you have a constant change of personnel and you actually invest and spend a lot of time training these people and also obviously managing them. Um, space, that might sound, um, sound a little funny, but actually space is a real concern too. Uh, my lab is maxed out at the moment pretty much. We have four undergrad students working on one data entry project and um, a couple of others working on other projects, plus I have a whole bunch of grad students and postdocs in the lab. So my graduate students start complaining about lack of space really. So you really have to think of how you want to you know, do things like that. Um, transcription errors, the quality control of the data, obviously. And this is one of the reasons you really want to keep a close eye, obviously, on the people who are working for you. But then again, that costs a lot of time. Um, another concern is damage to a specimen, because you really handle each specimen. You stick a USI label on them. And this is done not by you, but by people who work for you. So again, undergrad students or you know, relatively untrained personnel already. So this can be a real concern. Um, one other problem is that we're treating the specimen imaging as a separate workflow. So we're databasing and then later on we would go back and image certain specimens or set them aside for imaging after we database them. But we don't take images of the specimen and of the label data as we go through the process. And obviously, this is a pro uh, problem if you detect some errors in there. You can find that you will actually have to go back to the collection, find the specimen, which really isn't that difficult because they've all been barcoded. And we have barcode scanners to help us with finding them. But still, you have to go back to the collection and check out that particular specimen again. So obviously, if you had an image of that label stored and filed somewhere, you wouldn't really have to do that. So that could save time overall. OK, those were the challenges. You know, some more ideas on maybe how to solve them. So speed, or cost per specimen. So the experience from our ADBC project is it's not glorious at the moment, to put it that way. So the initial idea of the National Science Foundation, when they proposed that ADBC program, they said, we want to make sure that you guys capture specimens for about 10 cents a piece. And you look at these numbers, and we're not close, to put it that way. So we're spending about half a dollar to $1.5 per specimen as of May 2013. So things have become a little bit more streamlined, I would think, by now. So we might be doing a little bit better. But still, getting below half a dollar per specimen will be difficult overall, we think, with that approach. OK, training and managing of data entry personnel. Well, you can facilitate things in many ways. So um, you're going to be seeing when we transfer some more of the files to your computers on the, the memory sticks. There is um, a folder that talks about the Arthropod Easy Capture Database. And I put in that manual that we use um, to explain to people how the, um, how the database works. So data entry guides like that, the PDF version, but then also having help buttons on all the of the database fields. That obviously really helps to train people. So you can tell them before they even show up for their first meeting, you want them to read everything, come up with questions and make sure they understand what's involved. Then also, what I <coughs> personally find incre uh, incredibly helpful is just having videos. So you yeah, essentially have someone just walk you through the database, you record that, and then you can put that online as another guide and help. And then the other thing that's been working out really quite well, um, I would call them the more senior databases. Let's say students who've been working for us for a year or so have been through a lot of databasing, know the database quite well, know how to enter specimen data. Overall, they become mentors and they keep a fairly close eye on the undergrad students who are just starting, in addition, obviously, to the grad student and uh, um, the, um, the professors who are involved in that as well. But that works really quite well, making sure that you have one of the more senior people there at the time when one of the more junior people start working on things. Space, well, you really have to stack people somehow, and you have to, <laughs> um, well, what we're doing is we're trying to give them time slots and say, OK, you have to come in this time, or can you, can you come in this time, and, and so on and so forth. So we're really you know, stacking them around our, the availabilities of computers, obviously, in our lab. 
Okay, quality control of data. Um, well, obviously that's a problem. No matter how you do things, it's always going to be a, tr a problem. So what we're doing is data cleaning at various levels. So we have the database supervisors, that would be the grad students again, or the professors who are involved with a given project. We would do spot checks, essentially, and you know, make sure that things are generally being done okay. We don't claim we will find every error out there. Obviously, we will not. But if there's some major thing going wrong, we will pick up on that pretty quickly. Same thing for the database manager. So in our case, the database manager is actually located at the American Museum of Natural History. And she's running all sorts of checks on a pretty regular basis. If she realizes that one of the databases isn't, you know, is doing something wrong, she will notice that and send an email to them and us and um, alert us to that. 